Bandar Ali Reda, Secretary General of the Arab British Chamber of Commerce, Baroness Simon, Chairwoman of the Arab British Chamber of Commerce, Ambassadors, Dignitaries, Colleagues, Guests. It's a privilege to welcome you to the fifth session on youth employment and entrepreneurship. In the United States, there's a popular game show called Jeopardy. And the format of Jeopardy is the host provides the answer and the contestants come up with what the question is. So we're not going to play that, but we're going to do a little bit of that format for a minute and you can test your own trivia knowledge as we go through this. So for example, the first answer is 700 million. What's the question? The question is, how many youth are unemployed in the world today? 700 million. The next answer is 5 million. 5 million. The question is, how many youth in the MENA region are entering the workforce annually? 5 million. 30. The answer is 30. The question is, what is the percent of youth who are unemployed on average across the MENA region? 30%. That number almost doubles for girls and women. 14. 14 is the percent participation rate for women in the labor force in the MENA region. 14. And finally, two. Two trillion. Two trillion dollars is the economic gain to the MENA region if we're to cut in half the youth unemployment rate over the next five years. So youth employment is a challenge, but it's an enormous opportunity at the same time. Education for Employment is the leading youth employment organization in the Middle East and North Africa. We train youth in the skills demanded by the labor force, placing youth into jobs, helping to provide for themselves and their families, while at the same time providing the business community with the workforce that they need to grow their businesses. To date, EFE has trained and, play and connected to the world of work 95,000 youth will achieve 100,000 sometime this summer. EFE places a great emphasis on women's participation in the labor force, with 56% of our graduates across the region being women. Much of the success that we've had is due to partnerships, not the least of which is with City Foundation, who will be speaking on the panel today, and would love to take this opportunity to thank them for their long-standing support of our mission to employ youth and prepare them for work in the Middle East. I'd also like to thank a relatively newer partner, EBRD, who is going to be speaking here as well and working with us in Jordan. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to the panel and Salvatore Negro, who is the Vice President for EFE and the CEO for EFE in Europe. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you today? There's no afternoon session after lunch without a coffee that does not require a little bit of exercising. So I'll ask every one of you in the audience and in the panel to please stand up.
Thank you. It is scientifically proven that your brain got 20% more of oxygen. So the speakers will get 20% more of your attention. Thank you. Now I like, since you are all standing, I like you to close your eyes. I'm doing it as well, so I don't know if you're really doing it. And I like you to go back to your very first job interview. How did you feel? How nervous you were? What question are they going to make? Am I really prepared for that? Is this the right job or not? Well, this is what we're going to talk now. We're going to talk today about the challenges of youth unemployment, the solutions in the Middle East and North Africa, and most importantly, how this will provide talent to the companies who are investing in the region. Thank you so much for standing. It's now time for our panel. I'm really joined from a fantastic panel, as you can see. And we have Carmen Adat. Carmen is the chief country officer for Saudi Arabia at City, our long-lasting partner. Uh, and uh, well, obviously, Carmen has been senior executive at City since 2004. Joined City in 2000, uh, different position before that, also on JP Morgan. Uh, but very important, she was ranked by Forbes Middle East among the top 100 most powerful and influential Arab business, business women in 2018 uh, by Financial News in the top 50 most influential f women in finance in the Middle East. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for co-organizing City Foundation this, 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 uh, this session. I don't think this is working. Can we have the microphone? Can someone turn this on? Oh, excellent. So first of all, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you to the ABCC for obviously uh, organizing this in very incredible uh, event, but also to the EFE for, uh, for helping us uh, do this panel and really to address uh, some of the issues that we face in the Middle East region, primarily really focusing on the youth unemployment. I think funding and supporting employment through technical and soft skills um, is our combined global responsibility as global citizens. It's very important for us, especially in the Middle East and, and in North Africa, to look at the challenges and try to address them. And through partnerships that we do through City Foundation um, and working with, very closely with NGOs and specifically with EFE uh, in the last six to seven years, we're very proud to say that we've been able to achieve some of, those, uh, some of those milestones. Some interesting statistics that Andrew shared earlier today, but did you also know that unemployment rates in the youth are three times higher than that for the adults? And did you also know that nearly 150 million youths in the MENA region, uh, sorry, uh, globally today, may have jobs, but they still live uh, in poverty? So we have two challenges. One, to make sure that we empower people and set them up to enter the workforce. But more importantly also, we need to also make sure that we nurture them with the right um, skill sets and uh, work readiness skills. So obviously we know that there are too many people and not enough jobs. We also know that the technological advancements, the digital age in which we live, artificial intelligence and digital banking and otherwise, has meant that a lot of the low-paying skill jobs uh, have been eliminated. They've been automated, right? So what do we do with the youth that are coming out of university that are hoping to start their careers at the, at the basic level and earn those skill sets? They can't be doing that because a lot of their jobs no longer exist. Now there are some good news. The good news here is that governments and cities and otherwise are very, very much aware of this unemployment, the youth unemployment, and uh, obviously uh, the impact it would have if unaddressed. Um, and we saw and we heard today a lot about uh, obviously the, um, the sustainability development goals um, and the 17 charters that um, a lot of us are trying to obviously um, uh, you know, address. 
but we see a lot of positive signs in that respect, like for the SDG 8, which uh, focuses on, on decent work and economic growth. We are all trying, in addition to clean water, in addition to new cities, we are trying very hard to address the challenges of unemployment. In MENA as a region, we have the largest youth population in the world, with more than half being under the age of 25. Fantastic opportunity. In Saudi alone, which has a population of 32 million, 70% are under the age of 30. And as part of Vision 2030 and the Realization Program, there are two very important aspects to that. One is to make sure that we focus on unemployment, which today in Saudi Arabia is at 12%. And number two, that we make sure that women participation in the workforce is increased up to 30%. Um, and, and so obviously these are very, very important figures. Five million workers are entering the workforce every day and jobs are scarce. So obviously uh, the highest rate of unemployment is in the MENA region, 27% in Middle East and nearly 30% in North Africa. And may I add that six million people are currently unemployed in Africa, uh, in North Africa, sorry, and four million live, as I said, in poverty or uh, many of them work in informal sectors. And, and therefore, really, it's, it's, a, it's a, dramatic, uh, a dramatic challenge. We see three trends in the Middle East specifically. One is that not enough youths want to enter the private sector. We are conditioned in the GCC once we, um, once we uh, finish university to go into the, uh, to the public sector, to go into government, and obviously uh, join the public sector groups. In Kuwait, I believe the rate is 85% of graduates go into the, uh, the public sector. I think in Saudi Arabia it's around 65 and Qatar around 80%. So obviously that, that lag uh, we need to address. Out of the 4.3 million jobs that were created between 2006 uh, to 2012, 80% of those in the GCC were filled by expats. So obviously that is something that we need to address. And we estimate that in 2019 only 600,000 jobs will be created, uh, will be filled by the private sector. So there's also a gap in skills that employers are demanding. There was an interesting study by Ernst & Young that showed that employers once asked only 30% of employers in the GCC and throughout actually the Middle East feel that the graduates that they're interviewing have the right skill sets. And third, young people don't have access to job training exper experiences, which are very important uh, on the job training, being able outside just the classroom, but also to gain those soft skills in leadership, in mentorship, in conflict, uh, in conflict management, um, and other related soft skills that are, that are considered. In North Africa, we mentioned uh, women, of course, uh, the women uh, workforce have much, much you know, women have a much higher unemployment rate, despite higher education than the men. They suffer from a se the second highest gender gap in unemployment and pay equality. And as we said, that uh, un the unemployment rate for women is twice that for men. So what are we doing about all of this? Um, City Foundation has taken the initiative, which is called, it's a fantastic signature program that we're very proud of, which is called Pathway to Progress, by identifying and, and, and making sure that we commit to the unemployment uh, for, of the youths. This is a philanthropic commitment that is ever increasing, and, um, and we've decided that we're going to invest $100 million by 2020 to impact the lives of 500,000 youths aged between 16 and 24 globally. And we're going to make sure that 10,000 employees at City are also going to act as volunteers. They're going to mentor, they're going to coach, they're going to be advocates, and they're going to act as role models. Thus far, we've achieved a 50% success rate in the funding. So 50% of the 100 million has already been deployed, and 7,000 employees have already um, um, volunteered. So those are commitments that we think are very important to continue on. Now specifically to the EFE uh, and our partnership there, 
We feel that in the last six years, as I noted before, we've done tremendous program, uh, progress in having direct impact as well as building a strategy with our partners to see how we can help with youth unemployment. The focus in the Middle East and Africa region has been to really uh, more on the soft skills and also on women empowerment listening, communication, manage conflict, exercise empathy. And the age group is always between 18 to 24 years of age as they enter into university and as they come out of university looking for, for, for jobs. We're very proud to say that with the EFE, we've had a 50%, uh, 50 of the beneficiaries have been women. And in summation, we've had seven grants uh, in this partnership. We've completed five. We have one ongoing, and we're establishing a fresh one, uh, I believe, at the end of the year. The total commitment to date has been about $2.5 million. Um, and, you know, the nice thing about this is that we've impacted 2,400 uh, uh, lives in the, in, in the Middle East and North Africa, and especially in Saudi Arabia. Uh, places in Morocco, in Tunisia, even in the UAE, and to some extent in Egypt. So in summation, critical that we cultivate, to cultivate the entrepreneurship um, the spirits that we have in the Middle East. And obviously we can't do it alone. We need to do it with our partners. And we continue to inspire the young generation as they pursue their ambitions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmen. This is a follow-up question. If you, if you really have to choose one skill that a person who is joining uh, a financial institution as a bank, a first-time job seeker, need to have, what kind of skills do you really looking for? Well, look, the CV obviously makes a huge difference, right, in terms of the academia. Um, but I think what also is important is to understand the cultural affinities. Uh, I think what also makes a huge difference is, is, is if people have the right aptitude for learning. And also, uh, I mean, I always say to people, there's only two things you really need. You need to be trustworthy, and you, ha you have to have the, um, the incentive and the ambition to learn and to improve. Everything else you learn on the job, right? Whatever training you need, you will be provided. Um, I think in global organizations, you have the opportunity to place people in large hubs to put them through all the necessary trainings that they need from management associates to graduate programs. Um, and uh, most banks and other institutions run those. Uh, but again, I think building, building soft skills is important um, and making sure that people also understand the functions behind the business risk management, audit, uh, um, uh, AML risk for, in finance specifically, for example, uh, and making sure that people come out well-rounded in, in the way that they want to pursue their ambition and, and grant them as many opportunities through mobility. Um, I think a lot of institutions do very well in terms of gender diversity, in terms of equal pay. Uh, but also try to promote, uh, I, I mean, I, sit, uh, I sat for five years on the City Women Network as a, as a, as a co-chair, and I think what was very important for us was the mentoring program because uh, women, obviously, especially in the Middle East, sometimes don't have the necessary, I would say, confidence, even though they know a lot more than the men do in the room. Uh, but, but a lot of it has to do with putting your hand up and having the confidence. It really varies from region to region, but what's important is to have the right stepping stones. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we heard a lot about the results, what's happening in the Middle East and North Africa, how Education for Employment is working with the CD Foundation. I'd like to recognize we have in the audience the CEOs of the different Education for Employment organization across the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and they're, they're really the driving force behind it. If you can identify yourself for the audience, Please make sure during the coffee break if you can exchange what they're really doing. And a big applause goes to them for the endless, endless work that they're doing. And we have here with us Jean Lababi. Jean Lababi Berada is the CEO of Education for Employment in Morocco. Uh, before joining EFE, she led the development of a billion dollar social enterprise, uh, Group SOS. She also has work and experience with uh, in workforce development with the Clinton Foundation. So, Jeanne, I'm 
Tell us a little bit about what are the challenges that you are facing in Morocco. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes? Yep. Great. Um, so, Morocco, we have two main challenges, um, as pointed out by Andrew earlier. Um, um, a big percentage of the population that is very young and eager to enter the labor market and finally becoming adults. Um, but who are not necessarily equipped to embrace um, job opportunities. So an average of two and a half years to land a first job, it's a lot. And on the other side, um, companies that are growing and hiring but that cannot find the talent they need to thrive. So about one in three jobs in Morocco is, uh, remains unfilled just because people cannot find the talent they need. So out of those two sad realities, we saw an opportunity to create about 11 years ago um, EFE in Morocco. Um, we gathered with the business leaders, businessmen and women, who were feeling the skills gap within their companies and wanted to um, give back to their countries. And we established EFE that basically identifies youth who are willing to enter in the labor market but are not necessarily prepared for it. And we equip them with in-demand skills. Uh, they can be technical, they can be linguistic, or they can be soft skills and employability skills. And then we place them in jobs, because we don't want to create more frustration out of training them. We really want to connect them to tangible economic opportunities. Uh, so that's basically what we do. Uh, we are lucky to be funded by amazing partners like the City Foundation that makes all of this possible. So the programs are 100% free to our participants, which clearly removes all barriers to opportunity. Um, and we place them for tangible uh, job opportunities. So basically what we do, we identify the high growth sectors in Morocco, uh, for example, retail. Out of those sectors, what jobs are being created if I keep this example, sales associate is really high demand now. What skills are in demand for this position? So it can be negotiation skills, communications, ability to deal with customer service, and we train those youth for these specific jobs. We talk to employers. We have about 400 employers in Morocco, from very small SMEs to large companies operating across the region. We collect what we call pre-committed jobs, and basically what we tell, to, what we tell recruiters is, what are you looking for? Why do you struggle so much to find this talent? And would you believe in our ability to find people who are highly motivated, but not necessarily fully equipped right now to join your company? But if we train them for what you are looking for, would you be willing to meet with them? And they say yes. So we gather what we need to craft the trainings. We train them, and then we, they meet again with them. And they're really impressed. They say, I would have never believed that this person six or seven weeks ago would be ready to join my company and now I want to hire this person. They actually come back to us and say, we want to hire more people. We want you to train more people. We want you to train our current employees. So it really shows that we bring value to companies. And to date, um, in Morocco, we placed about 82% of our um, graduates and the retention rate is 94%. So it really shows that we bring value. So you, you, bring, you bring values, right? You bring values, get um, among the different values, because it's not only HR, it's CSR. What, what would you focus more on in terms of a return for a company? Where, where do they save? What do they? So our main belief is that the most precious resource for a company is its human capital. And my, when I talk to companies, I tell them we, we're not doing charity. We're providing you with untapped resources who are very eager to join the, the labor market. And if you invest in what we call diversity hires, you will better represent your market because you're trying to anticipate what your broad market wants. And if you're composed from people who are all the same, you cannot predict what other people may want. So it's important to represent your market within your own team. And if you diversify your team, you innovate more, you are more competitive, and you hire people who want so much work that they're extremely motivated and they're very loyal. 
The tenure of our graduates is about four years, which is a lot for, for our region. Most of them join a company for 10, 15 years and they grow a lot. So for companies who are constantly struggling with finding the right people and then once they find them, retaining them, we're offering people who are eager to come, learn, contribute, and innovate, and come up with new ideas to embrace a broader market. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm also joined. I know Carmen has a plane to catch, so we continue the discussion with Biliana. Biliana, pleasure seeing you. Uh, Biliana Radonich. Um, many years of international experience. Uh, she is uh, Associate Director and the Lead Inclusion Specialist at another partner of Education for Employment, which is the European Bank of Reconstruction and, and Development. She definitely focuses on promoting access to skills and employability. Rihanna has also been the, the one who drove the implementation of the EBRD first gender action plan. Uh, and she is also uh, very much engaged with the civil society, being a, a trustee of the Bear Trust, and uh, uh, definitely she, before joining EBRD, she created a consultancy, a strategic consultancy think tank, which is Civita, Civilitas Research. Uh, so, Biliana, tell us a little bit more. It's another institution, an IFI. What is he doing about employability, about skills? Why? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Salvatore. First of all, I would like to thank ABCC for organizing this fantastic event and also for EFE and the City Foundation uh, for, for co-organizing this session. Um, I think for the um, benefit of the audience who maybe does not know EBRD, I would just like to say a few words about uh, the bank and our approach to gender and economic inclusion, if that's okay. Um, so EBRD is an international financial institution based here in London, uh, which uh, invests in all, around 40 uh, 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 transition and emerging markets uh, uh, around the world, including uh, North Africa and Middle East, uh, some of the countries in, in the region. Um, uh, the mandate of EBRD is to promote sustainable economies. Uh, um, and by that, we mean economies that are economically competitive, that are financially uh, integrated, resilient, that are well-governed, and that they are green. But also, uh, importantly, that they are inclusive. Inclusiveness is is a, a key feature of sustainable economies in our view and by that we mean uh, that we would like to develop economies where every person irrespective of their age or gender or, uh, or geographic location has uh, full and fair access to a labor market, to finance, to broadly economic opportunities. So how do we do, uh, what do we do about it? Uh, EBRD has um, a gender and economic inclusion team uh, which uh, develops inclusion programs both at the level of investment but also at the policy level. Uh, we start with systemic assessment of inclusion gaps in any particular country, so how local economic institutions, markets and education systems uh, extend or not extend economic, uh, equal op economic opportunities to all members of society. We have a set of indicators, we have a sophisticated methodology according to which we uh, make choices whether to invest or not in a particular company uh, uh, to, do, uh, to do a particular thing. We set strong benchmarks uh, which we measure, monitor and measure throughout the life of an investment and at the end we are able to say whether what we set out to do has actually achieved, uh, achieved these, uh, these things. So um, uh, in, in, in the uh, economic inclusion sphere, we've heard uh, Andrew and, and the colleagues here spoke about challenges uh, that exist. Uh, I mean, uh, with this audience, there is no need to, to, to go into what, uh, what are the, the problems with uh, low female uh, labor force participation, with high youth unemployment, issues with, uh, that you mentioned about education systems not producing uh, graduates with the right skills that market needs, and our clients, what you said, echo very much. Our private sector clients are very much uh, telling us the same story. We don't have, uh, we are having trouble recruiting uh, the, the right quality of, of, of staff, retaining them. We have problems with workforce diversity uh, and, uh, and, and we, need, we need help. So um, this is where, uh, where we, uh, we, we come in. 
we, we had, we've done a great job in partnerships in, in Jordan. We have our CEO of Jordan over there over the, past, over the past few years. EBRD, European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, was actually created for uh, Central Europe, Asia. Why the Middle East and North Africa now? Mm. Well, um, uh, it is uh, obviously a region with, full of opportunities. This is a region, booming region, where, where we've got uh, a rising youth population. We have opportunities for investment. We have uh, excellent businesses that are capable of uh, absorbing the finance that we have. Uh, and, and, and just simply, uh, there, there is lots of opportunities um, to, to invest in the, in the private sector. Good. So. I'm sure here there is many private sector companies that are attending this forum would be definitely interested to learn more how to partner with, with EBRD mm -hmm. and we can definitely provide them this inclusion mm -hmm. strategy in the investments that they are making. Let me stop here and see if we have any questions from the audience at this point. Over here, do we have someone with a microphone? Uh, yes, my name is Rayhan Haddad. I'm a PhD student searching about exactly what you're talking about. I'm searching about women economic opportunities on female labor force participation rates in 175 countries, 16 years, 21st centuries. Which is very interesting to understand youth and employment. I think one of the main recommendations I found in my working paper right now is maternity leave. Paternity leave in Middle East countries. Please speak over the, the microphone. I can't hear you. According to child care theory, uh, women contribute more to child and men could domin dominate more in domain business. So I think um, as, a, as, a, as a main recommendation, child uh, maternity leave and fraternity and sharing and the, and the house capital as well, it's one of the main recommendations. And then for youth as well, um, we face, uh, as a youth employment, when they apply for job, they, are, they are already have a competition with experienced and non-experienced uh, candidates. I think to give the chance for support from the government, um, that to give them the trial for each sector, especially for women, because I'm searching about women, giving them the chance to try a new sector like um, Air Force or Tech, that they're not good used to it. That's using the lag in my data. That's helped as well because I saw in my findings that this year if we have increase in female and this sector will encourage more women to to move out to move on. I can't I can't hear the 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 voice, sorry. The question was to uh, the lady who was here that uh, yes we have uh, a high number and uh, unemployment. But then how can we avoid this number? What, what's your plan towards that? Thank you very much. Can you, can you repeat? So we have, we have high unemployment number and yes. yep. So how can we avoid this number? And how can we convince the government to build the government. new regulations okay. to support uh, unemployment, especially in Europe? Thank you. you work with government institutions and especially in women issues? Um, yeah, I mean, when we created EFE, the idea was not to work siloed, but to really act as a bridge between the private sector and uh, the public institutions. So our first um, strategic national partnerships were with the Moroccan Federation of uh, Companies, which we, we were actually based there for two years. It was ideal for us because we could reach out to companies uh, looking for talents to, to grow. Uh, and we set up a partnership with the National Employment Agency called ANAPEC uh, that is doing this job, but th that is lacking resources and insights from the private sector to really know where to train youth. And they don't train youth directly. They work with partners like us to um, identify um, private sector opportunities and then train youth and place them in jobs. So we could not do what we do as an NGO 
without the, the, the resources and the networks provided by the private sector, the companies, but also um, the, the public institutions, um, the ministries. And today we're really happy because we have reached a systemic impact, not only training directly our youth, but integrating our own programs into high schools, into public universities, into vocational training centers, so that we don't wait till those people graduate, look for a job for many years, and go through all it takes in terms of you know, mental health to realize that we are here. We anticipate that and we integrate that within the, the, the high school and, and university curricula, and we train the trainers because this is our way, the way that we identified for capacity building. To answer your question about women um, employment, very interesting insights. We realize the same things. Uh, there's many additional barriers to employment for women in the region. Uh, as soon as they get married, as soon as they you know, start their own family, they start thinking of having kids. And just the housework and the, the mom work is a job itself that no one looks at. You know? Thank you. And uh, Biliana, you? you mm -hmm. No, I, I just wanted to say that um, the EBRD is owned by a number of governments, and our main uh, clients are private sector. So we find that this uh, this is uh, an area which uh, is close to both uh, ones. Uh, what so governments want to make sure that uh, young people are, have employment, and the private sector wants to make sure to to get the, the highly qualified people. So so what we uh, uh, try to do uh, uh, is promote the private sector's role in the uh, in the skills development, uh, both through investments and, and, as I said, policy dialogue. And we come from a, a demand-driven uh, approach. So we, like yourself, we, we start with, the, with what our clients need. What are the, 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 the key issues that are uh, making their, their business, uh, 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 making difficulties for the business to, to grow, to expand to new markets. And then um, we partner them up with, uh, uh, with academic institutions, with training providers such as EFE, uh, who would then uh, uh, open up, help open up economic opportunities for young people who are seeking jobs uh, and so on. So uh, that, that is, uh, uh, then when we, when we see that there is, a, there is space at a policy level, we can then raise this uh, conversation at the level of a sector, look into setting up sector skills councils, we're setting, uh, setting up um, uh, occupational skill standards and so on that, uh, to, to, for a more systemic impact, as you said. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if we have time for just one one question, very very quick uh, over there. No, no, we are running Hi. out of time. Is, uh, Anita, I'm from Youth Business International, focusing on uh, supporting young people. Please speak over the, the microphone. Please switch on the microphone. Of the work in the um, um, region, um, beyond the kind of the matching of, of talent and opportunity. Mm -hmm. To address about the entrepreneurship? Uh, yes. Um, uh, EBRD has a, a very well-established uh, program called Women in Business, uh, where we partner with uh, financial institutions, commercial banks, and uh, microfinance uh, institutions to uh, provide training to loan officers, to the institutions themselves, uh, how to reach out to the um, segments of, uh, of the market that are considered to be more risky, such as women or youth. Uh, women uh, in Business is, is established in about 17 countries, and, and we have uh, managed to, uh, to develop a, a, a very, very good program that combines loans, uh, including first loss cover, as well as training for, as I said, uh, uh, partner banks, but also to the final beneficiaries, to, to, young, to women uh, who uh, own, uh, own businesses. Um, uh, we are now moving into the next stage and, and trying to, to uh, go into, into youth in business, and this is a, a more challenging, uh, I think, but this is a, a, an area that we, are, uh, that we are moving next. I think uh, starting with Egypt uh, and then and moving to other countries thank as well. You. Thank you so much. Well, thank you to my dear panelists. And a conference like this one, it's very important about connection, about connect. Connect means put in communication, establish a relation. Relations between the UK businesses and the Arab businesses, relations between the public sector and the private sector, connection between education and employment, connection between pathways and, po and progress. But um, to connect, and I'm Italian, as you could see, comes from Latin collegare, which is even more than putting connection. 
collegare comes from legare, which is really to bind the, the, the difference. So we're going to make a connection and we're going to bind now. I'd like to invite on stage the Secretary General and Chief Executive Officer of the Arab British Chamber of Commerce, Banda Reda, and the CEO of Education for Employment, Andrew Bird, for the signature of a memorandum of understanding between the ABCC and EFE that in the years to come will promote awareness among business leaders private sector, governments and civil society on the importance of youth employment and entrepreneurship in the regions. So thank you so much. And there are no great ideas without action. And this is going to be a first action for a successful collaboration. So thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the staff of the ABCC who has been working with us. And thank you to the staff of EFE, from Anna Martiningi to Valeria Pizzi to Sergio Branca, all the EFE Europe, EFE US teams that have been working on this fantastic session, as well as our partners of the CD Foundation namely Asna Bufkiri. Thank you so much. Thank you, Salvatore. Thank you so much for that session. Very interesting discussion.